Well, thank you, and uh, I congratulate everyone who had anything to do with this amazing two-day conference to see this place beyond capacity, uh, to get calls as far away uh, from Al as Alaska a few days ago, somebody very eager to attend and hearing that not only was this room going to be beyond capacity, but there wasn't going to be room in the overflow area. So that uh, speaks so well of this law school, of the Stegner Center, of all the great people who have helped make this possible and also we're very appreciative to all of the presenters and of course to all of you who have stuck this out for two days because it's been a remarkable time. So thank you all uh, for everything you're doing for this community, our nation, and our world. Let's see, is that on? Okay. Hmm. Okay. I hope it's the only thing that's asleep at this point. <laughs> Thank you. Together, all of us on Earth are facing an enormous challenge. The warming of our planet, due in large part to the burning of fossil fuels. Either we delay, obstruct, and wait for others to take action with disastrous results, or we pull together at all levels of government, in business, and in each of our individual lives to develop and implement effective solutions. Recognizing that each of us must do our part, and that in doing so we can inspire effective action by others, we launched the Salt Lake City Green Program in 2001 a comprehensive environmental program dealing with, and this may sound funny, but it's absolutely the truth, everything from dog waste to nuclear waste. A major component of Salt Lake City Green is our climate protection campaign, which has achieved very positive results, many of which can be replicated by other governmental entities, businesses, and individuals. We are able to inhabit the Earth because of a delicate balance of heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere, which acts much like a greenhouse. Sun rays travel through the atmosphere to the Earth, where some of them are reflected back. Some of those reflected rays travel through the atmosphere back into space. The greenhouse gases in the atmosphere capture some of the radiation and reflect it back to Earth. An accumulation of too many greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide and methane, causes dangerous global warming. John Christie, who we heard from earlier this morning, has said about global warming, and I quote, whatever happens, we will adapt to it. We heard from John Christie this morning that the troposphere, the atmosphere's lower layer, had not warmed and is actually cooling at the tropics. Wrong. Let me tell you what the New York Times says about those claims by John Christie and his colleague Roy Spencer. Andrew Revkin, uh, in an article August 12, 2005, entitled Errors Cited in Assessing Climate Data, some scientists who question whether human-caused global warming poses a threat have long pointed to records that showed the atmosphere's lowest layer, the troposphere, had not warmed over the last two decades and had cooled in the tropics. Now, two independent studies have found errors in the complicated calculations used to generate the old temperature records, which involve stitching together data from thousands of weather balloons lofted around the world in a series of short-lived weather satellites. A third study shows that when the errors are taken into account, the troposphere actually got warmer Moreover, that warming trend largely agrees with the warmer surface temperatures that have been recorded and conforms to predictions in recent computer models. The three papers were published yesterday. That would be August 11, 2005, in the online edition of the journal Science. The scientists who developed the original troposphere temperature records from satellite data, John R. Christie and Roy W. Spencer of the University of Alabama in Huntsville, 
conceded yesterday that they had made a mistake, but said that their revised calculation still produced a warming rate too small to be a concern. Our view hasn't changed, Dr. Christie said. We still have this modest warming. Other climate experts, however, said that the new studies were very significant, effectively resolving a puzzle that had been used by opponents of curves on heat trapping greenhouse gases. These papers should lay to rest once and for all the claims by John Christie and other global warming skeptics that a disagreement between tropospheric and surface temperature trends means that there are problems with surface temperature records or with climate models, said Alan Robach, a meteorologist at Rutgers University. The article goes on to say, starting around 2001, the satellite data and methods of Dr. Christie and Dr. Spencer were re-examined by Carl A. Mears and Frank J. Wentz, scientists at Remote Sensing Systems, a company in Santa Rosa, California, that does satellite data analysis for NASA. They and several other teams have since found more significant warming trends than the original estimate. But the new paper by Dr. Mears and Dr. Wentz identifies a fresh error in the original calculations that, more firmly than ever, showed warming in the troposphere, particularly in the tropics. Things being debated now are details about the model, said Stephen Sherwood, the lead author of the paper on the balloon data and an atmospheric physicist at Yale. Nobody, he says, is debating anymore that significant climate changes are coming. Now, I've gone off script a little bit, but the reason for that is that I find this use of science, the argument that carbon dioxide is a plant food and we don't need to worry about it, or that, that our carbon dioxide emissions are necessary for, as he put it, promoting democracy around the world, we all need to understand what has been happening, what the consequences are, and what the consequences are going to be for those who come after us if we don't meet our responsibilities as responsible stewards. Since 1958, an observatory atop Mount Mauna Loa, Hawaii, has taken measurements reflecting a remarkable 19.4 degree increase, percent increase, in the mean annual concentration of carbon dioxide during just the past 45 years. Carbon dioxide is the cause, directly or indirectly, of about 80 percent of all global warming. Carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere for about 100 years. In 2002 alone, the burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas released a total of 21 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Tracing the trajectory shown here, forward into the future reflects a doubling of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from the early 20th century to the end of the 21st century. The enormous increase in greenhouse gases has caused a very significant increase in average global temperatures. Due primarily to the burning of fossil fuels, our planet's mean temperature has increased approximately 63 hundredths of a degree Celsius, that's about one degree Fahrenheit, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The actual temperature increases since the late 19th century are shown here by the red line. The 20th century's 10 warmest years all occurred in the last 15 years of the century, and NASA just recently announced that last year, 2005, was this globe's warmest year ever since records have been maintained. Scientists predict that if current trends continue, Average global surface temperatures could rise, as indicated by this purple line, under the best case scenario, which would still be disastrous, 0.6 degrees Celsius during the next 50 years and 1.4 degrees Celsius during the next 100 years. And under the worst case scenario, as indicated here by the green line, temperatures could rise 2.5 degrees Celsius during the next 50 years and 5.8 degrees in the next century. We've been speaking up to this point of average global temperatures. However, the increases in temperature vary dramatically at different latitudes. For instance, Antarctica provides the most alarming examples 
of melting ice due to global warming. Three enormous pieces of Antarctic ice shelf have disintegrated since 1995. In February 2002, the Larsen B ice shelf, 1,250 square miles, more than 10 times the size of Salt Lake City, broke up in 31 days. Now, John Christie and others have talked about the Antarctic not losing ice sheet mass, and that uh, has been something that people have argued about for a very long time. I was fortunate enough yesterday, I didn't miss uh, the, the tremendous presentations that I heard about here yesterday, but I was in Washington, D.C. and picked up a Washington Post. And uh, coincidentally enough, the article in the Washington Post, Antarctic ice sheet is melting rapidly, says exactly the opposite of what you heard from Mr. Christie this morning. There it says in that article, the Antarctic ice sheet is losing as much as 36 cubic miles of ice a year in a trend that scientists link to global warming, according to a new paper that provides the first evidence that the sheet's total mass is shrinking significantly. The new findings, which are being published today in the journal Science, that was yesterday, suggests that global sea level could rise substantially over the next several centuries. Just last month, two researchers reported that Greenland's glaciers are melting into the sea twice as fast as previously believed, and a separate paper in Science Today predicts that by the end of this century, lakes and streams on one-fourth of the African continent could be drying up because of higher temperatures. Richard Alley, a Pennsylvania State University glaciologist, called the study significant and a bit surprising because a major international scientific panel predicted five years ago that the Antarctic ice sheet would gain mass this century as higher temperatures led to increased snowfall. It looks like the ice sheets are ahead of schedule in terms of melting, Alley said. That's a wake-up call. Congressional Democrats, including John F. Kerry and Representative Harry A. Waxman, said yesterday that the two papers show that the United States must act quickly to impose mandatory limits on carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. The Bush administration opposes such curbs on the grounds that they could hurt the country's economy. And uh, I'm, I must say that they're able to base their arguments on the kinds of, of things that we heard about earlier today and which you would see in Mr. Christie's testimony before the United States Senate, which is available on the website. It is clear that signs of catastrophic climate disruption are occurring in the Antarctic and that we're seeing so much similar there as we are seeing in the Arctic. Let's take a look at the polar ice cap. This is how the polar ice cap in the Arctic appeared in 1979. This is how much it melted, more than 20% between 1979 and 2003. The average summer temperature over the ice has risen two and a half degrees Celsius in the past 20 years, lengthening the season of ice melting by 14 days per decade. The Arctic is warming at nearly twice the rate of the rest of the globe. In parts of Alaska, western Canada, and eastern Russia, average winter temperatures have increased almost 11 degrees Fahrenheit since the 1970s. Located on the border of northwestern United States and Canada is the stunning Glacier National Park. From 1850 to 1993, there was a 73 percent reduction in the area of Glacier National Park covered by glaciers. In the 19th century, the park featured about 150 glaciers. Just more than a century later, there are now only 35. Here we see the astounding decrease in the Shepherd Glacier from 1913 to 2005. The melding of Grinnell Glacier between 1910 and 1998. And the devastation of the Cheney Glacier from 1911 to 2005. Scientists predict that at the present rate of warming, there will be no glaciers in Glacier National Park by the year 2030. 
The name will be the sole reminder of what once was. The melting of polar ice caps and glaciers together with higher sea temperatures has caused oceans to rise. Globally, sea level during the last century has increased four to eight inches. Tuvalu, a Pacific island, is already disappearing under rising ocean waters, an early warning of what is to come to coastal areas around the world. The entire coastal population may become environmental refugees. A rise of up to one meter in sea level, which has been predicted by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and in fact those estimates are increasing to more than one meter during the same period of time, would submerge major coastal regions around the world, including several major metropolitan areas in the United States, 17.5% of Bangladesh in an area where 10 million people currently reside, 6% of the Netherlands, and 80% of the Atoll Majoro of the Marshall Islands. Global warming results in killer heat waves. In 2003, the August European heat wave broke all records for heat-related deaths. There were 35,000 deaths, with the death toll in France alone nearly 15,000. A group of British scientists has concluded that the risk of major heat waves has doubled due to climate change. In the United States, heat-related deaths exceed those from all other weather-related deaths combined. 156 nations, including every major industrialized nation except the United States and Australia, have signed on to the Kyoto Agreement and are taking aggressive measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We know that Kyoto is just a modest effort and that carbon emissions must be reduced far more than called for by Kyoto if we are to reverse the trend toward disastrous climate disruption but, as with our many longtime allies around the world, many of us in the United States recognize the importance of the process, the importance of collaborative worldwide action to meet the challenge of climate disruption. Despite the abandonment of U.S. national leadership, Salt Lake City is committed to the Kyoto Protocol. On 2002, on the eve of the Salt Lake Winter Olympic Games, I committed Salt Lake City and its municipal operations to the Kyoto Goals. We set a goal to reduce emissions in our city operations by at least 21% below our 2000 baseline. We've made tremendous progress in the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. In 2004, just two years later, Salt Lake City achieved reductions of nearly 23,000 tons of equivalent carbon dioxide and we are now 76% of the way toward reaching our goal. The important point here is every city, every state, every nation, every business, and every individual can achieve meaningful, substantial reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Some people in our community have asked why the mayor is focusing on global warming. Their view seems to be that combating global warming should be someone else's responsibility. My response is that every local community is going to be impacted and that we are all in this together. We all need to work cooperatively to effectively combat climate change. The ski industry is a huge draw for tourists to Utah. If the prospect of devastating droughts, floods, hurricanes, mass starvation, killer heat waves and other climatic disasters are not enough to get some people's attention, then perhaps they will respond to the catastrophic impacts on the ski industry here in Utah and worldwide. Global warming is threatening the world's ski resorts. Downhill skiing can disappear altogether at some resorts, while at others a retreating snow line will cut off base villages from their ski runs as soon as 2030. Poor local air quality is a problem facing many of our cities. Bad air days in Salt Lake City severely impact the public health, recreational opportunities, sustainable economic development, and overall quality of life. On beautiful smog-free days, Salt Lake City is stunning. The outdoor recreational opportunities are unsurpassed, and the quality of life is extraordinary. These are the sorts of cities we and those who come along in the future deserve. 
As we combat global climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we will also reduce the criteria air pollutants that harm all of us. Air quality has become a challenge in every large city in the world. The World Health Organization estimates that every year 800,000 people die prematurely from diseases caused by air pollution. When most people think of air pollution, they think mostly of impacts on the lungs. Yet according to the National Association of Physicians for the Environment, air pollution can affect many other organs and systems of the human body, including the heart, the blood, and the nervous and immune systems. Children are at extra risk due to their increased need for oxygen in proportion to their size. To meet the most crucial environmental challenges, we each must provide leadership. We must empower others to take action, and we must effectively advocate in order to bring others on board, as we heard during the, the tremendous presentation that preceded this one. Leadership requires that we each become informed about the choices before us and choose wisely, even in the face of vocal opposition. Among our most important choices, do we pursue policies that promote sprawl, dependence on the automobile, traffic congestion, air pollution, and global warming? Or do we pursue cleaner air, preservation of open spaces, reduced burning of fossil fuels, and greater transportation opportunities through mass transit? Another choice that requires informed, effective leadership is whether we continue to rely in many parts of the world, including the Salt Lake City region, on the generation of electricity by and I think it was phrased a little differently before, but I call it the dirty, dangerous coal-burning plants. <laughs> Just keep that alliteration going, dirty, dangerous coal-burning plants. Or will we move toward more electricity production by clean, renewable energy sources such as wind, solar, and geothermal generators? Our first step was to determine everything we could do in every department of city government to operate in a more environmentally sustainable fashion. We completed a sustainability inventory, enabling us to catalog our environmental and economic resources in every department and ascertain the opportunities we had to make improvements in every area, including water conservation, toxic chemical use, and air quality. The second step was to implement an environmental management system based on the international ISO 14,001 standard. This requires each department of city government to fully comply with environmental laws and regulations, reduce the use of resources and generation of waste, continually look for ways to improve environmental performance, even if it meant going far beyond present laws and regulations, and to lead by example. We started out with those things we could immediately accomplish in which every governmental entity, business, and individual could do. I'd also mention college universities. We replaced all of our light bulbs in our city hall by replacing the energy wasteful incandescent bulbs with high efficiency compact fluorescents. We saved over $33,000 a year in electric bills and dramatically reduced the amount of electricity we used. With part of the money we saved, we became the state's largest purchaser of wind power. By taking these two simple measures, we save taxpayers money and reduce carbon dioxide emissions by over 1,100 tons each year. Then we moved on to our traffic signals. By changing to low energy LED traffic lights, we eliminated 500 tons of carbon dioxide emissions and saved $50,000 in lower electrical costs. This is a panorama of the world lit up at night. Most of the energy for these lights comes from dirty, dangerous, coal-burning power plants, which emit tremendous amounts of carbon dioxide. We teach our children to turn off the lights at home, so why do we forget those lessons in our offices, in our schools, in our public buildings? In Salt Lake City, we work to cut our city's consumption of electricity and thereby reduce the emission of greenhouse gases by reminding our employees to shut off the lights and computers whenever they leave their offices. We're working to create a, a clean fleet by converting our city's fleet of vehicles through right-sizing, that means using smaller vehicles whenever we can, and using clean alternative fuels. 
We got rid, in my first term in office, we got rid of 35 gas-guzzling sport utility vehicles and purchased smaller, more fuel-efficient cars. We now have 89 compressed natural gas vehicles in our fleet. We've purchased five new three-wheeled parking enforcement vehicles, like you see here in the lower right-hand corner, which use one-eighth as much gas as the vehicles they replaced. We even have a new gas-electric hybrid police car shown here. As I like to remind people, if you do get pulled over by one of them, at least tell the officer you appreciate them <laughs> driving the hybrid. We've also passed, I'm very, very pleased about this, we also recently got passed by the city council an ordinance that provides for free metered parking to all low polluting vehicles. Acting in our personal lives consistently with our publicly voiced values is, of course, vital to good leadership. My personal car is a compressed natural gas vehicle powered by the cleanest internal combustion engine made. It emits almost no criteria pollutants, and I fill it from my gas line at home. I live just a half block from here, and uh, it, it's amazing the possibilities in terms of reducing the air quality problems we have in this valley if we each, through our personal choices, seek a different way. As part of our Salt Lake City Green program, we encourage all sorts of alternative forms of transportation. Bicycling improves public health and helps create a vibrant community. Also, as this sign reminds us, bicycling doesn't require the burning of any fossil fuels. <laughs> We've added several miles of bicycle lanes in recent years and installed 45 new bike racks in our downtown area. We also have a pedal pass, which cyclists can use when they arrive on their bikes for discounts at participating businesses. Walking is another healthy, clean form of transportation, but one that does not come naturally to many auto-dependent Americans. It also helps create a more interesting, vibrant community. To encourage walking, we must make it as safe as possible. To make walking safer, we took several measures, including countdown timers for pedestrians, pedestrian actuated overhead lights, mid-block crosswalks, and even some in-pavement lights across the street to warn oncoming motorists that pedestrians are in or about to enter the uh, pedestrian lane, and of course the notorious orange flags at pedestrian crosswalks for people to carry with them as they cross the streets. People made fun of the flags in the beginning, some still do, uh, <laughs> as often happens when we try something different. But now the flags are very popular with other cities using them as well. Last year we were acknowledged as the most improved city in the United States for pedestrian safety. There is no question our pedestrian safety initiatives have saved lives. Although there was a good deal of derision aimed at me when I first put in the flags, they became popular enough that my campaign for re-election touted the success of the program. In the following Abbey Road scene, I play the role of a pedestrian flag-carrying Paul McCartney, <laughs> bare feet and all. We need the audio. Yeah, got to have the audio. I wouldn't spend a lot of time on this, but we've got some other audio later. Okay. Right. Okay. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Think it up. <laughs> All right. Buildings are one of the primary sources of energy consumption. There is much we can do to conserve the energy used in buildings. The U.S. Green Building Council's LEED rating system promotes construction of buildings designed for energy and water conservation, material reuse, 
and improved user comfort and productivity. Our recently completed intermodal transportation hub is the first LEED certified building constructed by Salt Lake City government. The hub will unite light rail, buses, cabs, bicycles, and a future commuter rail in downtown Salt Lake City. I recently issued an executive order requiring that all new buildings owned and operated by Salt Lake City government must be LEED certified at least at the silver level, as must all major renovation projects. I'm also asking our city council to require that all buildings utilizing any city funds be at least silver LEED certified. At our wastewater treatment plant, we capture the methane and utilize it to fuel a cogeneration facility, which produces about 6 million kilowatts of electricity per year, about one half of the electricity requirements for the entire plant. This results in a reduction of the greenhouse equivalent of 3,000 tons of carbon dioxide each year. Also, methane at our landfill has in the past been captured and flared. Now the methane will be used to provide electricity to a neighboring municipal energy provider. Committed to smart growth principles, Salt Lake City looks far into the future to plan our city in ways that promote walkable and transit-oriented communities. Many people resist greater residential density in their neighborhoods, but when it is well designed and close to transit, Greater density can help make a community more attractive, safe, and environmentally sustainable. My administration takes a transit-first approach to all development projects, including opposition to highways pushed by state legislators, so that future growth... <laughs> so that future growth will not be accompanied by more automobile congestion, more roads, less open space, and increased pollution, but with public transit opportunities afforded by rapid bus systems, light rail, and commuter rail. Through all of these programs, we have made tremendous progress in the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions since commencing our climate action plan in 2002. By 2004, as I said earlier, we achieved greenhouse gas reductions of nearly 23,000 tons of carbon dioxide or its greenhouse equivalent and are already 76 percent of the way toward meeting our 2012 reduction goal. And these figures do not count the reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from such initiatives as a major expansion of our recycling program, our transit system, the high performance building standards, or our other smart growth policies. Much can be done by government at all levels to empower others to contribute towards solutions. There is one, uh, I, I learned about this today, the Sierra Club, uh, Tim Walker's here, they're urging government huntsmen to sign an executive order to require the reduction of greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions by the state of Utah and in the state's uh, operations. This is something that we can all empower ourselves by promoting, by asking our governor to sign this kind of an executive order to make that sort of commitment. We in Salt Lake City seek in every way possible to empower local businesses, individuals, and other governmental entities to take effective actions to combat global climate change. In order to empower local businesses, we created our E2 business program. E2 stands for environmentally and economically sustainable. City staff takes what we have learned about conservation and utilization of cleaner sources of energy to local businesses, inventorying what those businesses are doing and what options they have for waste reduction, recycling, more efficient transportation, conservation of energy and water, and improving air quality. Thus far, 37 local businesses have become E2 businesses. Salt Lake City has pioneered an environmentally conscious framework that makes it easy for business of all kinds to participate in a program that saves money, energy, and time. Salt Lake City teamed up with our local electric utility and issued a twice as nice community challenge almost doubling the number of residents and businesses purchasing wind power. This many people switching from coal burning, dirty, disgusting, dangerous, coal burning production of electricity 
to clean renewable sources is equivalent to keeping 2,700 cars off the road each day. In 2001, Salt Lake City began offering a 90-gallon blue recycling bin to residents free of charge. Since the launch of the Blue Bin program, the amount of recycled materials in Salt Lake City have increased by 87 percent. The U.S. Conference of Mayors and Novellus, Inc. has sponsored a Cans for Cash national competition with awards for most aluminum cans collected and for the most innovative campaign to encourage recycling. We won the award for the most innovative campaign in the nation last year by building these huge receptacles in the shape of a recycling logo and then the letters SLC below it and having the community, mostly students, fill them with aluminum cans. This year we won the most innovative award once again. We held a competition asking young people to submit ideas for an advertisement to be produced and aired by a local television studio. Here is the winner. Okay, you heard the expurgated version, the little boy dancing with the girl. The original, and this was written in all innocence, I'm sure, he said, I like your cans. <laughs> <laughs> so at the request of some of the parents, we changed it, we dubbed in, I like your dress. Traffic congestion creates more air pollution, causes illnesses and even death, leads to calls for even more highways and the destruction of open spaces, and while eating up months of our lives over the course of years, causes more and more social isolation. It doesn't have to be like this. In Salt Lake City, we are pursuing a different route. We faced tremendous opposition to our light rail system before it was built in 1999. Here you see a, a, they were even calling for the UTA director's resignation because he had the audacity to push for a light rail system. Now the system has expanded to a 19-mile system with more to come in the future, including a heavy rail commuter system that will eventually connect cities and towns along a 100-mile corridor. And I find this as real inspiration whenever we're up against opposition. And we know that, that we're doing the right thing for the future. Uh, you'll remember how many people were saying nobody will ever ride it. Well, more people are riding it, way more than ever projected, under even the most optimistic projections. And because of the success of this light rail line, Voters in three of what have to be the most conservative counties in the United States, except perhaps Alabama, <laughs> these voters voted for a sales tax increase dedicated solely to transit, and that's why we're seeing commuter rail built today. Ridership of our light rail system has far exceeded the projections. As I said, on average, 125,000 Utah residents board the bus or light rail trains every day. Success is breeding more success as those who adamantly oppose light rail are now clamoring for it in their communities. And we saw just recently the poll. Did you see this? And this is another example of how the people are so far out ahead of their elected officials who are so timid about doing anything differently. Seventy percent of residents polled now support a commuter rail system from Salt Lake City to Provo, and those are Utah County residents. That is really something. 
No matter our own successes, we will effectively combat global climate change only if we advocate so that others, other governments, businesses, and individuals will join with us in doing what they can to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. We get out as much as we can to speak with young people about sustainability and what each of us can do to make this a better, healthier world. I work with student activists who, at the University of Utah, led the charge to increase tuition by one dollar for the purchase of clean, renewable energy, and that was a tremendous campaign. We organize fun, community-oriented activities to encourage environmentally friendly behaviors. Every year we have Mayor's Bike to Work Day. Our local biking community is now comprised of very effective advocates for more access to safe bicycling opportunities throughout our city. On February 16, 2005, the date on which the Kyoto Protocol went into effect, we celebrated the occasion by having a lick global warming gathering at a local ice cream shop. We gave away free ice cream and a compact fluorescent bulb to those who would sign a pledge to reduce their personal greenhouse gas emissions. I've been pleased to present to groups all over the United States about the measures we're taking in Salt Lake City to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. I've traveled to Florida, Denver, New Mexico, Washington, D.C., and other cities to demonstrate how feasible all of this is and to encourage others to take similar steps to join in the fight against climate disruption. I also serve on the board of the U.S. branch of ICLEI, the International Council on Local Environmental Initiatives, without whom I don't think we could have done any of the measuring and the setting of a baseline that we have. I'm a founding member of the New Cities Project and on the steering committee of the National Leadership Summits for a Sustainable America. When others replicate our successes and when we can learn from the successes of others, the effect overall can be very significant. Last July, Robert Redford, along with the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, hosted the Sundance Summit, a mayor's gathering on climate protection. Forty-six mayors from throughout the United States met with several experts, including former Vice President Al Gore, to learn the science of climate change and to strategize about actions we can all take to combat global warming. Coming together and sharing success stories is a crucial means of leveraging our successes into even greater positive impacts. We've taken our case to the international community, presenting to municipal and business leaders from throughout the world at the United Nations COP8 conference on climate change in New Delhi, where I was sponsored by the United States EPA, at the United Nations COP10 conference in Buenos Aires, where I was sponsored by ICLEI, as a consultant to the assistance for heads of state in London in preparation for the G8 summit, where Prime Minister Tony Blair designated climate change as one of the two main agenda items, and at the Business and Sustainability Summit in Australia. Among the recognitions for our efforts have been the Distinguished Service Award from the Sierra Club, the Climate Protection Award from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the International Leadership Award from the Association of Commuter Transportation, the Leadership Award for Green Power Purchasing from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and Department of Energy, and recently the World Leadership Award in the environmental category uh, in London. We have the means to make a real positive difference by all nations, all businesses, and individuals working collaboratively we can meet the challenges of global climate disruption and make a better, safer future for all. Thank you. Mayor Anderson will take uh, a few questions from the audience. I know it's late. Yes. I think you've done an absolutely fantastic job. I'm, I'm proud to live in the city and I do many of the things you're advocating. I'm not quite sure why you wanted to take on John Christie the way you did, because he's an outstanding scientist in doing the measurements he does. And He's a, an impartial, a healthy skeptic. 
and we saw some here today, we shouldn't deride the skeptics amongst us. We should, we should admire the, the people that sort of speak out. Well, we don't need conformity. Yeah, the, the, and I absolutely agree with that. Uh, not needing conformity, I don't think I've ever been accused of that. Um, I do think, though, that uh, those who are presenting the United States Senate and helping form the basis for this administration's disastrous policy, uh, there is too much on the line for the future. Uh, we've already seen so many uh, very adverse effects, effects that are impacting whole cultures, as we heard about uh, earlier today. Uh, it's, it's, it, what we saw in, in the Gulf states, the environmental refugees, that's going to look like a picnic compared to what we're going to see with continued climate change. And I just think we need to say, get away from uh, these emissions, get, a, get away from uh, dependence on foreign oil sources, uh, find a better way. If we did commit to an Apollo-like project, this nation could achieve such great things. We could do it in a way that would benefit our economy and benefit the rest of the world. There was no derision intended. I just simply wanted to set the record straight in terms of what people uh, are saying about the science because uh, there are a lot of folks, and some of them have been sponsored, frankly, by the oil, gas, and coal industries that have been out there trying to cause a lot of confusion. That's been a campaign of misinformation. Uh, very clearly that's been the case. We all need to get on the same track in this country. Mr. Christie. Not necessarily, not until we see safe reprocessing, and, and which served as the basis for our nation's nuclear energy policy, but it's been an unfulfilled promise from day one. Uh, I, I think that uh, if we could safely reprocess that fuel and not have to worry about transportation storage, uh, I think that would be absolutely uh, a, a miracle and something we would all embrace, uh, but we're not there. And uh, we've, we're manufacturing uh, uh, spent fuel rods. We're creating this problem that's going to be around for tens of thousands of years, and we haven't figured out a way to safely transport it or store it yet. And I think that's very clear. So we do have other options. Uh, we've got, we know about wind. We know about wave energy. We know about geothermal. We know now about... Uh, how many of you know about how they, maybe you read this article recently, no, you probably don't read that newspaper, the, the, uh, uh, how the church office building here in town heats and cools the building. It's from ground water heat transfer, drying the heat off of the water that's warmed by our earth. That's amazing. 
how many of you have hot water tanks at home? You know, there are just so many. Why are we heating water? Well, we're all sitting here. You don't need hot water sitting at home being heated and wasting energy. There are so many different things that we can do. And uh, I just think that, that we're on the edge. We're seeing uh, BP call itself beyond petroleum. I think uh, when, when you're seeing automakers advertising almost every magazine you pick up, you're seeing them brag about, uh, you know, that, that, that they're hybrids or that they're using other alternative fuels. And it's becoming now more and more a matter of personal ethics. And that's something that is so absolutely important. When we create that ethic, when people don't feel good about driving around in their Hummers anymore, where they're embarrassed at that, and they should be embarrassed, when we start building our buildings in a way that makes sense, the two main sources of our problem are our buildings, the energy that we use in our buildings and the way that we get around. And uh, we know there are better solutions. And in, in dealing with those solutions, we all accomplish independence from foreign oil. And we're going to see, as a result, although CO2 isn't, as you call it, a pollutant, uh, there are certainly other criteria pollutants that come along with what usually produces CO2, and we need to start cleaning up our air. Uh, if, if we all drove natural gas vehicles, by the way, I didn't mention this, but we have the second largest number of natural gas gas stations in the country. We're second only to California. So it's easy, it's convenient, it's really inexpensive, and you don't emit any criteria pollutants if you drive a natural gas car. So I appreciate you being here today. And, and uh, I think it's so important that we not just listen to each other, but we get all the information and know that we can work together and exchange information. But on the whole, as you said today, I think, I think what you'll find even on the EPA's website, and they have a great section on the certainties and the uncertainties, the certainties are the globe is heating up, and it's in large part because of what we as human beings are doing, the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, the uncertainties, you know, that's like saying we question that the sun's really going to rise in the morning because we don't know exactly what color it's going to be or exactly what the temperature's going to be. The fact is we still know the sun's going to come up. We know the globe is going to continue warming. Even if we stopped all CO2 emissions today, it's going to continue warming because that stuff stays in the atmosphere for upwards of 100 years. So we've all got a lot of work to do, but we've got to be real honest with each other, and we've got to work in every way we can. And I, I want to take off on what was said earlier. I thought the presentation before mine was so absolutely on the mark, and that is don't expect your elected leaders to provide the leadership and do the right thing. Uh, they've never done it. They didn't do it. <laughs> it's absolutely true. They're not out there doing the reading and learning about this, and, and you know they're looking for political calculations. Why did we sit by as a nation and watch 800,000 be butchered in Rwanda over the course of 100 days. It's because there was no political call for it. We have to provide that political pressure, that political call to take effective action, and every one of us in every single way we can to make this important difference. Thanks very much.